we ever get up here. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Second Baptist Church. It is awesome to see so many people today and get to visit with you and share with you and to talk with a bunch of you. And I've missed a bunch of you. So if I haven't said hi to you already this morning, hi. There you go. Everybody's been said hi to this morning. Got a lot of good stuff happening yesterday. Our men's fellowship had its first of what will be a frequent set of meetings, and we're going to turn that into a ministry group. I appreciate those who helped to organize that. Our brother Mike gave us a good uh, devotion time and, and spoke to our hearts. Gave us some good work. Thank you, Mike, for that. And to those who prepared it and all that, we appreciate that. And lots of stuff's coming up. Wow, I'm out of breath. I'm just so excited about things at Second Baptist Church, I'm out of breath. But uh, we got... We got uh, a Sunday School Teacher and Workers Appreciation Banquet coming up in the association. And we need to hear from you pretty quick. If you are a Sunday School Teacher and Worker or are going to be in the fall, uh, if you would please let my wife know. She would love to put your name on the list. Uh, we've got some good entertainment lined up. It'll just be at First Baptist Church here in town. And Sunday School Workers from all over our association are invited to attend this particular event. So we're looking to see a couple of 300 people there all of whom love Sunday school, wants you to come. So uh, please let Luann know so she can get your name on the list and we can get uh, that done and, and settled. A lot of other things are happening. Falls Creek Youth Camp has finished and uh, almost 3,000 young people is the last number I saw and maybe bigger than that by now, made decisions to follow Christ this year in the eight weeks of youth camp at Falls Creek. That is just exciting. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to share that with you. Um, there are a couple of more weeks of, of meetings going to be going on down there, but still great stuff's happening. And uh, in spite of what Miss Corona might think she can do to us, God is still on his throne. People are still getting saved. The gospel is still getting out. And we're still having church right here as we meet together at Second Baptist Church. Are you glad you're here today? Amen. I'm glad you're here today. Let's open up our, our, our hearts and our mouths and our minds. And let's, let's worship with some music, Miss Beth.
Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that we can be in the presence of the almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, sovereign, holy, mighty God, and that he gives us the privilege of serving him. Isn't that great? And, and not only that, but he gives us an open door. We call it prayer to come before him and to say, this is what I need, this is what I feel, this is what I want, this is what I think. And, and, and we can tell him silly stuff. <laughs> we can tell him difficult stuff. We can tell him stuff that nobody else in the world cares about, knowing that he's going to care about it. And we can talk about the stuff that everybody in the world's talking about and worried over. And here's just the same. Isn't he a great God? Amen. So we're going to pray. This is our regular prayer time. Maybe you'd want to come and join me at the front of the room. And I know that you know somebody who's lost you can pray for. We've got several folks that are dealing with health issues and different things today. And we just want to take them to the Father. So if you'd like to join me, you may. And let's go to our Father in prayer. Well, Father, we are grateful for the privilege of an open door. We don't deserve it. All of us have in our own time and in our own place turned our back on you, shut you out, failed to listen to what you had to say, failed to follow what you directed. For that, Father, we were sorry. But in that, Father, we're grateful that, that you don't throw us away, you don't push us away, but you just keep letting us come back over and over again. Thank you, Father, for being so gracious and kind and loving to us that in our lack of merit, you've opened up the door so that we can have what we don't deserve. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We know many people who don't know Jesus, and this morning we lift them up to you, Father. We think about them all over this room. We think about them by name, and, and I pray, God, for those who who don't have the assurance inside of them that you have saved them, that you have forgiven their sin because of what you gave us through Jesus Christ, your son, that they wouldn't let another day go by without knowing that your love is there for them. Father, send us. Don't just send somebody. Send us to go talk to that person. Share with that person how much you love them. We pray, Father, that they be saved. And we pray for the souls we don't even know. So many people are lost. And Father, the the, we, we know the answer to the world's problem is Jesus. We know that. It's not tons of social programs. It's not tons of money. It's not more education. It's, not, it's Jesus, Father. We know it is. So we pray that Jesus would shine and reign. And, and that from this place and in our homes and in our lives, that we would lift Jesus up in everything that we do. Help us, Father, to do that. Father, we know that there are difficulties going on in homes. We have difficulties with children. We have difficulties with parents and husbands and wives who are uh, having uh, sickness and different things going on. And Father, you know them all. And as we consider them, and each of us in our mind has something different on our mind right now, you know what they are, Father. And I pray that you would heal homes and that you would restore bodies and that you would stop suffering and that you would give wisdom. I pray, God, that you would give strength that people understand the might and the power that comes from knowing you. So we pray, Father, against all of the stuff that's going on in this world, but we pray, Father, for the real answer to take hold and for peace that passes understanding to reign in this world in our hearts and minds because that comes through Christ Jesus. So as we continue to sing, and as we open your word, Father, I pray that the words which are spoken today in this place especially from this preacher, would not be my own, but that would be yours. For this people in this place, that you may be lifted up and glorified. Oh, God, be glorified today as you touch our lives and help us to leave a little different, we pray. In Jesus' name.
I'm out of breath again. Just listening. Just listening. I want to take you to Joshua chapter number 5. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then it comes Joshua in your Old Testament. And I want to take you there and look for chapter number 5. Because in chapter number 5, we see some interesting things occurring in the life of the children of Israel. We've been spending a lot of time... And on Wednesday nights, we're kind of finishing up uh, in Genesis and getting to the end of the, the life of Joseph and all of that. And, and, and if you'll recall from what you've studied and what you have learned <clears throat> and what you've learned from your, your looking at the book of Genesis, you'll recall that in all of this stuff that happened, God was bringing the children of Israel into the land of Egypt. And he did so first by bringing Israel himself, that's Jacob, because of his son Joseph down into this land because of the famine that was in the land. There during that famine, Joseph saw to it that Israel, that is Jacob, that is the father of the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel, that they had the best of the land, the land of Goshen in Egypt land. And there they were able to take care of the livestock. And there they were there to serve. And they were serving Pharaoh, but doing what they did. They were, they were shepherds. They were keepers of the, of the livestock. And there they had plenty to eat. And there they were taken care of. And there their numbers began to multiply according to the covenant that God had made several generations before Jacob with Abraham. So you see how all this is coming. Somewhere in the midst of that time, in the midst of that service, there was a Pharaoh who came who did not know Joseph and did not understand his ways. Did not realize that the blessings that were occurring in the land of Egypt were because of the faithfulness of a man named Joseph to his God. And that the good care that was being given to his people and to his sheep and to his pastures and all of that were there because the people of God were there because Joseph brought them there to take care of his own family because God put him in Egypt to bring his family there. You see, God's been working all along through all of this thing that's going on. But in the midst of that, the numbers of the Israelites began to grow. The Bible tells us that they grew to such a number that the Pharaoh who did not know Joseph began to be a little paranoid about what was going on in the world that he lived in and in the realm over which he reigned. And so he began to oppress the children of Israel, those Israelites who should have been up in the land of Canaan, but they've come down and now their numbers are so strong that they're going to take us over. Therefore, we need to rein them in a little bit. And he began to give them work. He began to enslave them. He began to oppress them to such a point that they were no longer free people living in the land of Egypt, enjoying the good of the land and being good citizens in the land. But now they were slaves. God intervenes through a man named Moses. Are you, are you seeing how the picture of the story is flowing here? God intervenes and calls Moses and says, Moses, you go to Pharaoh. You tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Suppose he won't. He will. Just tell him who sent you. Well, who shall I say sent me? You tell him I am has sent you. And the God who was and is and is going to be the one who over all time, over all things, is, is, is sovereign. The God who's working his plan and looking out for the good of his people. The God who is working a plan for redemption for people that they may have everlasting life is working now with Moses. And Moses goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh turns him down, plague one. Pharaoh turns him down, plague two. Seven plagues. Finally, the Passover happens, and the firstborn is killed. The children of Israel are gone, and they walk out, and Pharaoh's army tries to chase them, and God drowns them in what some scientists are saying about three inches of water. I'm telling you, if it's only three inches of water, I'm okay with that, because that makes God's miracle even bigger. He drowned a whole army in three inches of water. I don't think it was three inches of water, but... But God's moving and God's doing great things. And they get into this land. Joshua has now taken the helm instead of Moses taking the helm. And as Joshua is beginning to do it, now we see the writing in the book of Joshua. Okay, so you caught up to see how the story comes together. And, and, and in the book of Joshua, he's there and they come to this place called Jericho. By this time, there are millions 
of Jews. Where we've left off in Genesis and where we'll pick up on, on Wednesday night, there were about 75. But by this time, there are millions. So some time has had to pass for those generations to have had their children and had their children's children and so forth. To get to the millions that wandered for 40 years through the wilderness. And finally, they're ending up outside of a city called Jericho. Now, when you get to chapter 5 and verse number 13, it says that Joshua was by Jericho. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? I, I love the way the cotton patch version of the Bible puts that. Be you for us or against us? That's what he's saying. But I want you to notice something else in case you're missing a subtlety of this passage of Scripture. That every word is there when Joshua was speaking to him. In that last sentence, and Joshua went to him. It's got a capital letter. Said to him, it's got a capital letter. Are you, it's got a capital letter for us. And, or are you our adversaries? You see, here is this one. And the reason he's got a capital letter is because this is no mere soldier with his sword drawn. In verse 14, we see again a capital he. So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. And Joshua remembers back to what we read in Exodus chapter 2 when Moses saw this burning bush that wasn't burning. And he said, I think I'll step aside to see what's happening. And there he was told to remove his sandals for he was standing on holy ground. And God doesn't want anything between you and his holiness, not even the sole of a shoe. Have you considered that? God doesn't even want your socks in between you and his holiness. And when you come into contact with the holiness of God, he wants all of the things that we have to have. You know what? We, we didn't have to have shoes before the fall, before sinfulness. Did you know that? Didn't have to have them. There wasn't any stickers to get in your foot. We in Oklahoma know about those stickers, don't we? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Ooh, I'm, I'm just remembering. I'm remembering. We, we know about them. The little, little, little itty bitty teeny, and the great big ones, too. And there, there was no cold or hot things to burn our feet on. And there were no pointy rocks that we were going to cut ourselves on. But because sin entered the world, we had to start wearing shoes. Something to stand between us and the holiness of God's creation. To protect us from the penalty of our sin. Take off your shoes. The place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did just that. And when Joshua finally got to the place where he had the stuff that was between him and the holiness of God removed from him, and in this case, it's symbolized by his shoes, Joshua heard some wonderful news from God. Let me, before we get into chapter 6 and see what that wonderful news is, and, and you guys know the story that we're getting to uh, where Joshua's going to march around the walls of Jericho, and y'all know the song and all of that that, that used to be sung. And so, um, it, it, before we get there, I just want to get this. I want this point to become so very clear to us. If you wonder why you're missing what God seems to be saying all around the world. If you wonder why people can say and you hear from them, you know, God made it very clear to me that he wants this or that from me. That I, I really truly believe that God made this intention in my heart become solid and real. And you wonder why you don't hear those things. Let me just ask you this. What's between you and the holiness of God? What, what, what sock are you? It's just a sock. But it's between you and the holiness of God. What, what do you mean? A sandal? Moses probably, I'm sorry, Joshua and Moses too. Probably was not like me. When I walk around my house, I have a pair of sandals that I wear, and yes, I wear socks with them, okay? He probably didn't have his socks on, just his sandals. 
It's just a little little piece of leather strapped to my foot because the sand is so hot and I, I need to be protected from it. And so I'm going to wear this little sandal, but it's in between him and the holy place. And God wants us to be in touch with the holy place. You don't believe me? Go to the New Testament and find out when Jesus was crucified and when he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished, Father, into your hand I commend my spirit. And the curtain, the veil that was at the Holy of Holies, which was the place that represented the very presence of God, the curtain from the top to the bottom was torn in two and people for the first time had free access at any time to go and see the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant that represented the very presence of God and there was nothing in the way because listen the blood of Jesus had been shed and because the blood of Jesus had been shed there's a different thing going on now we no longer need to go to the temple with this big holy sacrifice and, and, and sacrifice our prize bull instead we get to take him to the county fair and win a blue ribbon with him okay and, 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 and any any bull worthy of being sacrificed to the Lord better be at least a blue ribbon bull don't you think God, God wants us. Anything you're going to sacrifice better be worth it. It needs to be your best. It needs to be your best. Sometimes God's going to tell you to give your very best thing away. It's easy to give away the leftovers, isn't it? It's real easy. Got all my bills paid. And I got an extra $5 bill in my pocket. And this guy over here, son, I'll go buy him a big kid's meal at McDonald's. He can get a cookie and fries and a sandwich and a drink. He ought to be fine. I got this extra. But what if that was the $5 you were supposed to eat with that day? You see, God wants us to make sure that there's nothing between us and his holiness. I wonder what's getting between. I wonder what's in the way. When you can't hear God's confirmation that you're doing right or that you're thinking right or that you're saying right or that you're going right or that you're spending the money right or that you're going to the right places or that you're looking at the right things on whatever screen it is that you look at or that you're reading the right books. You know, people still use paper books, right? You know, and, 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 and God's looking at what you do. God's looking at where you go with that car. God's looking at what you're thinking about that person and all of those things going on. And I wonder... What if that stuff's getting in the way? The holiness of God. Remember in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah says, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the glory of his train filled the temple. And as he began to see the glory and the holiness of God, as God's holiness was revealed to him and he saw the Lord like none of us have ever seen him and we won't until the time that we get into eternity. God, God opened his eyes for something that he's not yet let us see. When he got done seeing the glory and the holiness, and the majesty, the power, and the sovereignty of the Almighty God, here's what he said. I'm a great guy. I'm going to go out and do great things. Look at me how blessed I am. And I'm just, right? Is that what Isaiah 6 says in your Bible? Nope. It's not. Some people are trying to preach it that way, but here's what it is. When Isaiah saw the holiness of God, his answer to that holiness was this. Woe is me. Now, woe just isn't a word we use a whole lot today. But it's a word that's it, it, it's the strongest word that was available in the Hebrew language to be written down on those original writings that says, I am the worst of the worst. I'm the bottom of the heap. I'm the least of the least. He said, woe is me. I'm in a terrible predicament. I'm in a bad place. He said, I am undone. Wow. What's getting in the way? Of you seeing the holiness of God. That lets you realize how bad of a place we're really in. How terrible of a predicament our sin has given us the, receipt, the receiving end of its benefit. And you're getting in the way of hearing what God has to say to you. When you get before God, you're going to hear from Let me tell you what else he's going to do in, in, in Isaiah. It was really cool. Because God took an angel and he brought a coal over from the fire. He said, Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he took an ember, a coal from that fire and cleansed the lips of Isaiah with that. God took care of the problem. 
And then in the holiness of God that Isaiah was privileged to see and recognize himself in the midst of God said, now we've got a task to do. Who's going to go for me? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. He heard from God what God wanted him to hear. And I wonder what's getting in the way of our hearing from God, of our being connected to, even with just the soles of our feet, the holiness of God. What sandal? Do you keep wearing that gets in the way of you seeing the holiness of God so that you can hear what God has for you to say? What God might say to you is to go and to tell and to preach. What God might say to you is to go and to give and not keep. What God might say to you is to step back and teach somebody else how to go and do what it is that you've been doing all along. What you might hear God say is, hey, things are going good, but I've got something else for you. What's getting in the way of you as an individual, of me as an individual, of our church as a group, of our land as a whole, being close to the holiness of God? What sandal did we keep on our feet to protect us from that place? It's time to take our sandals off, metaphorically speaking. It's time to take the shoes off and... Get in touch with the holiness of God. In this case, God has some really strange instructions to give, but he has some really good news with which he began the story. But first, Joshua, the one who followed Moses in the leadership of the people of Israel, the one who became the heir apparent to the, the, the prophet, prophet mode that God had given to Moses, the one who would speak. For God, first he had to get in touch with the holiness of God. He had to take off his sandals. I, I, I it, none of that was in my preparation for today. I think God's speaking to somebody today. We need to take off the sandals that get in the way of our being in touch with the holiness of God. And he did that, and he took off his sandals. The, the end of verse fifteen, and Joshua did. So I hope as soon as you hear what God's saying to you and he begins to give you instructions. All right, well, let me see here now. Let me figure this thing. No, you're just going to take off. You say, and Joshua did so. And here's what God said to him. Here's what he said. He said, verse, verse 1 of chapter 6. Now, Jericho is securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went in and none came out. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. Here's the first thing that he said. He said, the siege is on. I want you to see the siege today. I'm doing S words today if you're writing stuff down. I want you to see the siege. God provided for that siege. It says in verse 2, I have given Jericho into your hand. Joshua's probably walking around, pacing around. Okay, God, the, the, the armies of, of Jericho, they're inside. We're not letting any food or drink or anything go in. We're not letting anybody come out. The city's going to die. It's going to fall. If we just sit out here, and, and there's millions of us, so we're okay. And we can go out, and we can find some food and some things, so it's all right. But we, we got it. So, God, what do you want us to do? And God says, well, now, look, I've given Jericho to you. All the mighty men of valor. I've given you the king. I've set this up for you. And the siege is working. But you're not done yet. Because Jericho, remember, was not the final destination. It was the entire land that God said to Abraham, See, as far as you can see, I'm going to give this to you. A huge piece of land. Still under conflict today. But it wasn't just Jerusalem. It wasn't just what we know of as Israel. It was that whole great big land. And they're sitting over there fighting over one little strip of it. But God said, listen, this isn't all of it, but here's what we're going to do from here because it's not over yet. Verse number three, I want you to see, here's what he told them to do. You shall march around the city, all your men of war. You shall go in and around the city once, and you shall do this six days. And how many of you know that six days is not a completion? I think, I think uh, Joshua probably knew that too. And Joshua said, but God, can, can you imagine being Joshua? 
You took off your shoes. You got out of the way of not hearing what, and you're listening to him. You're connected with his holiness, but still in there, his thinking had to come. And he would say, but God, the siege is on. You just said so. I don't understand. Nobody's coming out. Nobody's going in. You just said you gave me the king and all the mighty men of valor. Now you want me to get my guys up every day and make them walk around the city. God, yep, that's what I want you to do. I want you to do that. But on the seven priests are going to bear trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. See, you're not just going to do that. You're going to do that with the holy vessel that represents my presence. Every day you're going to show them who I am for six days. Every day, you're going to show them who I am. Six days, you're going to walk around that city. Just one time every day. We're not going to make too big of a show, except for it's going to be huge, because all of your army is going to march. All of your mighty men and your priests, seven of them with ram's horns, and the ark. And so it takes about a dozen people to move the ark and do all that. And we're going to show them who I am. And we're going to do that for six days. And then verse 4, but on the seventh day... You're going to march around the seven times. And, 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 the, and the priests are going to blow the trumpets. Okay? On the seventh day, how many of you know that seven in the Bible is a complete number? So it's God's number. I don't know, but it means completion. It's a fulfillment. Seven days of creation and so forth. We can go on. But, but seven in the Bible is a number that's completion. And, and I think God being consistent the way he is, Joshua probably got that. Seventh day Seven times. Completion. And the priests, the men who are supposed to help us worship God, are going to blow the trumpets that are going before the ark, which is our representation of the God that we serve. We, we don't worship the ark, but it represents who God is. And it shall come to pass, verse 5, when they make a long blast on the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet... That all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. So now I want you to see, not just a siege, but I want you to see some soldiery. I remember in 1987, uh, in, in 1987 I uh, got on an airplane, flew to Chicago, from there got on a bus and went to a place called Great Lakes Recruit Training Center of the United States Navy. Got off the bus and we went into this little room that had some bunks on it. It's about three o'clock in the morning. They said, get some rest because it's gonna come early. And at about five o'clock that morning, the Navy alarm clock went off. You know what the Navy, some of y'all know what that is. It's, you know the big, big metal trash cans that's kind of corrugated and a big old stick that the, the drill instructor carried, he gets inside that, you know, the Navy alarm clock went off and they got us up and it began. One of the first things that they taught us how to do was to stand up in line. And after they taught us how to stand up in line, there was some marks. And they said, this is how you march. You take one step and it's this far. You take one step. Is this, go back, no, you need to do it. Take one step and it's this far. And, and that's what we're going to do. And so we learned how to take that one step. And we learned that three of those steps is supposed to be so many feet. And we learned this and that. And we learned how to make a turn. And we learned how to snap to and stand in tension. And we learned how to be, even though we were sailors, we learned how to do some marching that day, which is what soldiers do. I always wondered on a battleship where they're going to march us to. Because those things aren't much bigger than this room. But we had to learn how to do it. You know why? Because a soldier needs to learn how to be in unison and work together. And marching, even for a sailor, is a great tool to teach somebody how to do that. So we got some soldiering going on. Not only that, but when you see, and you can, you can see it in parades, and you can see the marching band Carl works with and stuff, and you can see it on the football fields and stuff, when you get some folks that really are good at marching, boy, that's awesome, isn't it? And I mean, just, just going down the street, you see 100 people all, same step, doing the same thing. And, or, or you see them on a football field, and they're doing all this choreography that they're doing, moving around and all that stuff. You see, they're showing the unity of the team. And for six days, they were told to soldier on. 
to march around that city. And in six days, I want you to show them the unity and the power and the majesty of the God that you serve. You march them around and you put priests in front of that ark and you carry that ark and you put men in front of the priests that are, that are armed and you put men behind the ark that are armed and you make sure they know how important and how high and how mighty I am. You will be good soldiers and you do that. And so Joshua verse 6 the son of Nun called the priest and he said, take up the Ark of the Covenant. Let seven priests bear seven trumpets. There's two more S's. you got seven priests and seven trumpets. But bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, proceed, march around the city. Let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horn, went before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark and the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came up after the ark and the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And Joshua commanded, oh, oh. Verse 10 is very important. Don't gloss over verse 10. Joshua had commanded the people, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout. Then you shall shout. I mean, here's the deal. God didn't tell you to go up and tell them, look at who our God is. We're so big. You're so stupid. Didn't tell them none. Didn't tell them to walk up to them. Your sinfulness, Jericho, has come before the presence of our God. And you see his majesty illustrated as we are marching together here, blowing the horns. I just sometimes, sometimes it's time to just be quiet, isn't it? Now, if this was 15 years ago, I could say it a little more bluntly. But it's not 15 years ago, and we're not allowed to say shut up in the pulpit anymore, so I won't say that. But sometimes it's time to just do that, isn't it? Sometimes when we think we have all of the answers, and the children of Israel did because they knew the power of God. They had seen it in themselves and in their parents for 40 years as they had been wandering around in the wilderness daily being taken care of by the power and the care of God. They had seen it by the siege that was so simple to overtake in the city of Jericho. They had seen it in the stories and the history that they heard of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Sometimes it's time to just be quiet and show your faith. That's what God told them to do for those six days. Six days, just get up and shut up and march up. Get up and walk around. We're going to let the music play a little bit, give you something to march to, but, but we're just going to march around the city. And in our marching, we are going to make it evident how powerful and how much glory our God has. Sometimes when we speak up, we mess up the message, don't we? Sometimes when we open our mouth, we mess up what God's trying to say in a certain circumstance. I know how many times, I tell you, this mouth, for me, I don't, I don't open mouth, insert foot. I open mouth, change feet all the time. I mess it up. I mean, by now, I've got a good case of athlete's tongue. It's just, it's just bad. Because this mouth sometimes can speak more than it ought to. I, I hope I'm not alone with that. Please, please am I alone? Y'all raise your hand, help me out. Your mouth ever gets you in trouble? Four or five of you, thank you. I appreciate that, that camaraderie that's going on. I'm telling you, it's so easy to speak up when God wants us to hush up. So easy to say, well, I know the right answer. Let me tell you all about what's going on here. God's going to come and God's going to punish us. And sometimes we just need to be quiet and live our lives in front of people who need to see Jesus moving in our life so that when it's time to speak up, they'll believe what it is that we have to say. Sometimes we need to live it in such a way that we undo some of the doing we've already done. I know I do. And I know I'm human like the rest of you. Sometimes the stories of our past precede us. And sometimes we need to show them before we tell them. 
how God has taken charge of our lives and has changed things and has fixed things and has sometimes demonstrated through his caring and loving chastening that we were wrong and accepted our repentance and has made us right. For six days, march around, let the trumpets blow, display the glory of God. Let's get that part right. Let's get it figured out. Let's get it worked out. Let's do this part first. So they did. And Joshua told them, don't shout. Are, are you seeing this? Don't shout. Don't make any noise with your voice. And, and can you imagine some of y'all, and I know some people like this, uh, that, and some, some of you in this room, and I'm going to look over here so I'm not looking at Tammy, but, but um, if music starts playing, somebody's going to start humming, somebody's going to start singing. Okay, Me and Tammy both do that. It just Tammy doesn't even have to have music playing. She's got her own music box going in her own, and, and it just goes like that. And, and, oh, Carl saying me too, Carl, you know. And so the horns are blowing, and we're marching. We got a good rhythm, got the rhythm of the feet, you know, going on. And the horns are. Some people just can't. But Joshua said, "Ah, uh, don't make any noise with your voice. Not a word shall proceed out of your mouth until I tell you to. Shh, I'll give you a chance. Then I'll tell you, but not yet." So they begin to march, day one. They get up, fix their breakfast, and put on their uniforms, shine up their ram's horns, get the ark ready to go, and off they go, marching around, and they go march around the city of Jericho, and then they put the ark back where it belongs, and they put the horns down, and they go sit down and eat their supper and have their nice afternoon. Day two, God has provided for all of these people plenty of food to eat, plenty of things to do, and they get up and they put on their clothes and they eat their breakfast and they shine up their ram's horns and pick up the ark and begin to, cut, to, to walk around the city and day two around the city. And they go and put the ark back in its place. And after they put the ark back in its place, they go back into their, their respective tents and homes and huts and whatever they had set up there. And they spend time with their family and eat their dinner and they go about their daily life. And the third day they do the same. And the fourth day they do the same. And the fifth day they do the same. And the sixth day they do the same. And by the sixth day, maybe when they got up, they got up and said, here we go again. Here we go again. Joshua, is it time to shout yet? I, I got to think. That in the midst of what was going on, marching around this city one time every day, when it's possible to march around this city seven times in one day, we know that, don't we, because of the rest of the story? That marching around it one time every day and then going back and being bored with life for the rest of the day has got to be making those people kind of antsy. Where they might be saying, is it time to shout yet, Joshua? The city is still under siege, Joshua. Tell us, is it time to shout yet? No, you shall not make any noise with your voice until I tell you to. But when I tell you to, then you're going to shout. Is it shouting time yet? Are we there yet? Hmm. Day 7. Verse 11. Let's just pick up there. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. And they came and lodged in the camp. Verse 12. And Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord and the seven priests bearing seven trumpets and ran to before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets and the armed men went before them and the rear guard came after the, the armed men and they went before them, and the priest blew the trumpets. Verse 12. And on the second day they marched. Finally they had gone around six times but then it came to the seventh day. Uh, in verse 15, when it came to pass on the seventh day, they rose up early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And on the day they marched around the city seven times and the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, are you ready? You ready, guys? Everybody pay attention. Here we go. Here's Joshua. Here, here's Joshua. He's going to say it. Shout! For the Lord has given you this city. And they began to open their mouth. I don't know what they shouted. Maybe they shouted, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Like the angels were singing in Isaiah's passage. Maybe, maybe they were shouting the, the Shema, the great writing that Moses had given them by which they lived. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. I don't know what they shouted. But I knew when God says it's time to speak, 
He's got a wall to come down, and the city shall, and, and he's, he said, shout for the Lord's giving you the city. In verse 17, now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to his destruction, and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot, shall live. And he did all of that kind of stuff. And in verse 20, so the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpet. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. How many of you know that when you speak at the time God tells you to speak, and when you march at the time God tells you to march, and when you carry the ark when God tells you to carry the ark, and when you listen to the trumpet sound when God tells you to listen to the trumpet sound, and when you go around the city just like God tells you to once or twice or seven times, when you do it just like God says, that God's got a victory at the end of that that's going to be amazing when we do it God's way. But he had to do it God's way. That wall didn't fall down flat because they had great machines of war. They didn't blow big catapults and, and, and knock it down with big boulders coming off of catapults. They didn't take big beams and knock down the walls. They didn't plant explosives and they blow up. What they did is they followed what God said and the advantage was given to them because they did what God said. God's way. You wonder why you're not finding success? Are you doing it God's way? You wonder why what you're living is not working out? Are you doing it God's way? You wonder why the gospel seems to be a little bit weaker than it was 30 years ago? Are we doing it God's way? You wonder why the church isn't vibrant in the world like it was in our culture back in the 70s and 80s and 60s? Are we doing it God's way? Have we marched around the city just like he said? Have we waited for the appointed moment when God gives the instruction to shout? Because I'm telling you, when you do it God's way, it works. Having trouble in your home, are you doing it God's way? Having trouble with your money, are you using it God's way? Having trouble at school, are you going to school God's way? Having trouble at work, are you going to work God's way? You having whatever, are you doing it God's way? I'm tell you, God's way works. Well, what about thus and so? Because... God hasn't given us anything in the Bible that specifically addresses thus and so. Well, let's look and see what the Bible might say concerning uh, how it plays out and what it works. But I'm going to tell you, God's got a way. We've got to quit letting the world tell us what God's way is. We've got to keep walking with God and doing what God says. I am. Um, some of you saw it uh, yesterday. Um, on, on Facebook, somebody had posted something I just couldn't help. I had to respond. You been there? I, I had to respond. He said that um, Jesus was Christ, but but Buddha was also Christ, and you are Christ, and I am Christ, and Christ is just a word that means the best in the world or the good in the world, something like that. And I just, oh, that got under my skin because that's what the world is trying to say that everything. Everything is, is it. Let me tell you, there's a lot of different roads to get to Jesus, but only Jesus will get you to God. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There's only one Christ. His name was Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so I put on there, Buddha never claimed to be Christ, and he never did. In fact, Buddha was in favor of Jesus. He wasn't a Christian, but he was in favor of Jesus. And uh, he would never have claimed to be the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. So I put on it, Buddha never said that. Where did you get that idea? And by the way, I never claim to be Christ either. I'm just a lowly, mediocre representative of who he is on this earth. He needs to do his best to do things his way. But listen, if you do things Steve's way, that's not going to work out for the glory of God and your salvation and in your life. If you do things the Baptist way, it probably won't either. If you do things any religious following's way, whether it's Buddha's or Mohammed's or whoever's, whatever, that's not the deal. You've got to do it God's way. And only when we do it God's way will we experience what Joshua experienced. And it's spelled out for us in verse number 27. There's, there's a whole lot to go on. They saved Rahab because she helped the spies out. Yet they killed and burned everything and all of the precious stuff was consecrated to God. And later, much of it was used in the temple. And, and, and you can keep reading the story and see how this fits into the whole story of Scripture. But verse 27. You see, Joshua 
led the children of Israel to do it God's way. Verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua. And his fame spread, spread throughout the country. I don't care about the fame stuff. But the Lord was with Joshua. Why? Because Joshua did that silliness of every day. Getting up. Polishing up the horns, picking up the ark, getting the guys with the arms to get before and after, and getting the soldiers and everybody ready to march, and playing the music and marching around that city every single day for six days, showing this is the God we serve without a word. And on the seventh day, got up real early in the morning, about the break of dawn, and they began and they marched around that city seven times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The trumpet blew. Joshua gave instruction, and the people shouted, and the victory was finished because they did it God's way. Uh, one day the trumpet's going to sound, and we will hear the shout with the voice of an archangel, and our Lord is going to return. Amen. I believe in that. I believe that there is going to be a rapture in the church. And if God lets us live our physical, earthly lives long enough, we're going to see it happen. If not, I believe that we're going to be in a grave and that grave's going to open up and we're going to come up and somehow God's going to put a, a body back together. It will be a glorified body and we shall forever be with him, it says. Thus we shall ever be with him. There's going to be a trumpet sound. And the walls of the physical universe that hold us back today, the things that we have to do, like wear shoes because of sinfulness, <laughs> No need for that anymore. The hurts and the illnesses of this world are going to be gone. Face to face, we shall behold him. All of our pains and sorrows will be reckoned with. Our lives will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And we'll be forever. We'll be forever with the Father. of us to do it his way. You see, the loving God who's going to come and send his son Jesus to return and to take us home is also a just God. He's also a vengeful God. He's also a righteous God. And he's only made one requirement. Simple requirement. And that is to turn yourself over to him. And you do that through Jesus. Don't make atonement for your sin any other way than to say, I trust the blood of Jesus that paid the price for you. That's God's way. I, I beg and plead because of the blood of Jesus for my sins to be forgiven. And without much begging and pleading, God says, you're forgiven. Just because you asked. I walk with God and I do my best every day to live for him in light of what he's done for me. And, and, I, and I walk around so folks can see who I'm serving the best I can. Because I want the Lord to be with me. When you do it God's way, listen, if you try to do it another way, if you try to earn or merit it, if you try to say enough words or do enough stuff, you're going to fail and fall flat on your backside. And when the Lord returns, you're going to wonder what happened. Well, you probably won't because you're sitting here listening to me now and I'm telling you. But if you do it God's way, I'm not trying to balance the scales because the scales are so far out of balance. I don't have enough to do that, but my Lord can take me off those scales, cover me with the grace that is given me by the blood of Jesus Christ and by going through him and no other name, I found that I can be saved. So can you. Do you know Jesus? Do you? That's the bottom line. Do you know Jesus? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. No one is looking around. Each one is looking within. Our musicians are making their way to the stage to help us with some music for our, our, our invitation time. In the next few moments, we're going to give you an invitation to respond to what you've heard. Here's what, here's what I hope you've heard. The question is this. Do you know Jesus? Are you doing it God's way? 
today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, when we stand and begin to sing, I'm going to ask you to walk from the place where you'll be standing to the front of this auditorium and, and, and let us share with you, and we'll do it smiling and happy, how you can know Jesus as your Savior and how you can forever be with Him and how you can know that the Lord is with you every day. Not that every day will be happy and perfect, but the Lord will be with you. That's what He promised. Jesus. Father, I pray. And I pray in the name of Jesus, your only Son who was crucified, who gave his life for us. And I come today, Father, begging not for my salvation, for you. You made that clear. You set that up. But I come begging and pleading for those who don't know. Those who will hear me today and say, I've been trying to do it my way for so long. Father, convince them, I pray. I'm asking you, Father, convince them that it's not their way, it's your way. It's not because of a religious experience or a baptism or going to church, but because of what Jesus did. And draw them to you, Father. So that they'll understand the gospel. So that they can come to you. Oh God, I pray for souls to be saved. Touch us now. So that your will will be done in every life present. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand as we stand and sing. Would you come today? It's been great to be with you today here at Second Baptist Church. Glad you joined in. And I hope today God's spoken to you about how you can uh, live your life and about what he wants from you. And if he has, and if you want us to visit with you about that, please contact us. There's a lot of contact information right here on this forum. But even better than that, we'd just love to meet you face to face right here at Second Baptist Church next time we meet and be able to visit with you and share with you the love of Christ, lifting him up every day. So come on back to Second Baptist Church where God's love comes first and where you're important to us. God bless you.